Hey everybody, Necroxis here, and welcome back to another extended look at one of Warcraft's hero characters. Today I'm going to throw you a bit of a curveball, although if you watch my video about the 5.2 lore object stories, you already know what I'm going to say. Or if you know, paid any attention to the picture at the start of this video. Anyway, this video is about Gelbin Mechatork, the High Tinker of the Gnomes. There isn't much theory crafting I can actually do after I cover his history. So I'm going to be using the second part of the video to explain a capacity that I would like to see the gnomes fill in the immediate and extended future of the lore. So let's get started with his history. Unlike most of Warcraft's faction leaders, Galbin Mechatork's history before his rise to power is actually pretty much unknown. But what we do know is that before he became the leader, Galbin graduated from Gearshaft University inside Nomergon alongside his longtime friend and future colleague, Sicko Thermoplug. In the truest sense of the race, Galbin exemplified what the gnomes valued as important traits. He is creative, quick-witted, inquisitive, altruistic, inventive, and incredibly intelligent. And also, unlike the humans and the dwarves, both of which will become their future allies, the gnomes had not chosen a leader by simple royal lineage in over 400 years, instead choosing to elect leaders by a simple majority based solely on whose inventions were the greatest and their potential benefit to the gnomish race. Mechatork's first claim to fame is the invention of the Mechano Strider, a mechanized tall strider mount that revolutionized gnomish travel, finally giving the diminutive race a mount that could keep up with the dwarves' rams and the humans' horses. At some point before the Second War, as we actually don't know when this really happened, Galvin Mechatork was elected to the leader of the gnomes by the rest of his race, to the ultimate position of High Tinker, primarily due to his invention of the Mechano Strider. And while the gnomes rejoiced in their new brilliant High Tinker, there was one who so vehemently disagreed with the decision that his sanity actually broke. Sicko Thermoplug, the now High Tinker's former colleague and friend, was enraged at the decision, as he himself was also a name being frequently floated for the position of High Tinker, and after losing the position, he began maneuvering himself to become the High Tinker's personal advisor. For years, Thermoplug plotted ways to overthrow his friend and secure the position for himself. Meanwhile, the Alliance of Lordaeron had been formed after the destruction of Stormwind at the hands of the Orcs in the First War. Joining their steadfast dwarven cousins in joining this alliance, the gnomes sought to prove themselves after having not involved themselves during the first war. Gnomish technology was invaluable during the second war, with both their flying machines helping battle the horde's dragons and their submarines securing naval superiority. Ultimately, the alliance won the second war, but Mechatork was not content with simply enjoying the victory. During the Second War, Ironforge and the Gnomes were locked out from the war fairly early on by the Horde, and despite their technological advances aiding the Alliance, the High Tinker realized that a high-speed way of transportation between Dunmoreau and Stormwind was necessary. As such, he drew up plans and eventually constructed the Deep Run Tram connecting the two Great Kingdoms. Following the Tram's construction, Gelbin and Sicko continued to develop technologies that would aid the Gnomes and the Alliance in the future. Prior to the Third War, the two friends had designed the prototype for the Dwarven Siege Engine, eventually perfecting it as the war began. And while Nomergon continued to supply its allies with its technology, the Gnomes did not send personnel to fight for Lordaeron against the Scourge and the Burning Legion. This act greatly surprised both the humans and the dwarves, however the survivors of the Third War eventually discovered the grim reason as to why the Gnomes could not reinforce their allies. As the Legion began its invasion of Azeroth, Nomergon found itself being invaded as well. Not by demons or undead, but by primitive creatures resembling mutated dwarves called Trogs. Knowing that his allies were dealing with the undead and the demonic invasion, the High Tinker was determined to stop the Trogs on his own. Turning to his advisors, Sicko put forward a potential plan. The gnomes would retreat to the upper level of the city and seal themselves off and release a toxic gas to kill the trogs as they entered Lower Nomergon. Sicko told the High Tinker that he tested the radiation levels of the gas and that it would only stay in the quarantine areas in the lower city. To prove his theory to his friend, Sicko had falsified numbers on his reports and guaranteed a success. With the trogs quickly beginning to push further into the city, and having no real reason to doubt his friend's argument, the High Tinker enacted Sicko's plan, and it failed spectacularly. 
Not only did the trogs not die, but they became irradiated, enraging and invading quicker than before. Thermoplug's filtration system, which was also promised to the high tinker to disperse the gas away from the gnomes sealed in the upper parts of the city, also failed, and upwards of 80% of the gnome population in Gnomergon perished as a result. In addition, the majority of the city was poisoned with radiation, which would last for decades. Forced to abandon the city, the High Tanker took what remained of his people and fled to Ironforge, begging the dwarves for safe harbor. As the evacuation took place, Galpin learned of his friend's betrayal. Thermoplug, driven mad with envy over not being named High Tinker, devised a plan to let toxic gas kill 30% of the population of Nomergon. Afterward, he would swoop in, defeat the Trogs, blame the debts on his former friend, and become High Tinker himself. However, the gas ultimately proved deadlier than Thermoplug had realized, and ended up eliminating 80% of the population instead of 30%. And with such high numbers of their people now killed, the gnomes rallied desperately around their High Tinker, further increasing Thermoplug's madness. After arriving in Ironforge, Gelbin learned that Thermoplug had remained in the deepest depths of the city, and had become as irradiated as the Trogs themselves. In his corrupted delirium, Thermoplug had finally gained what he sought for for decades. He became the leader of the irradiated city, stylizing himself as the king of Nomergon. Thermoplug had gathered other corrupted gnomes, now known as leper gnomes, under his command and they fought with the Trog for dominance of the poisoned city. In Ironforge, Mechatork and the surviving gnomes constructed Tinkertown around the Deep Run Tram, vowing one day to retake their city. Once the High Tinker learned that his former friend had not only not perished, but was responsible for the near genocide of their race and the irradiation of their city, he began conscripting Alliance heroes to travel into the corrupted Nomergon and kill Thermoplug themselves. Ultimately, several different groups of Alliance heroes reported the death of the, quote, King of Nomergon, but Mechatork realized that they were simply decoys to throw off the High Tinker. Mechatork realized that defeating his former friend would take more than a few Alliance heroes, and began plotting a different plan to retake their home. During the events of the Burning Crusade and Wrath of the Lich King, the High Tinker sent his able-bodied people to the Alliance in whatever way they could, but he himself remained in Tinkertown to finalize his operation. After the death of the Lich King and months before the Shattering occurred, the High Tinker put his plan into action after many years, calling the retaking of the city Operation Nomergon. Using support from both his own people as well as other races of the Alliance, Mechatork led strategic assaults against Thermoplug's leper gnomes. Eventually, the High Tinker and his forces successfully recaptured the outside of Nomergon and began pushing into the city. Despite Thermoplug unleashing a radiation bomb within the city, Mechatork and his forces cleared the irradiation out and reclaimed the few first upper levels of the city. Although they could not ultimately kill Thermoplug and recapture the entire city, the advancement was more than the gnomes had been able to accomplish in years. After defending Ironforge and the military ward from elementals during the elemental unrest immediately preceding the cataclysm, Mechatork returned to Nomergon and established New Tinkertown, a village just outside of the city itself. As his forces slowly retook more and more of the city, the High Tinker traveled to his old private quarters in Sector 17, confused as to how such a deep part of the city had been retaken so easily. Eventually, the High Tinker finally broke down, alone, in his private chamber, remembering the fall of the great city. He admits to himself that he had to be strong for his people, and began weeping for the loss of the majority of the gnomish race. His conscience finally beginning to clear some, he admits that he feels better after this, and begins to explore the rest of his old private chambers. He realizes that the area was trapped by Thermoplug a second too late, and soon finds himself surrounded by three large trogs. Having left his weapon at the surface above, and dismissing his guard so he could examine his old home himself, the High Tinker once again proved his ingenuity by defeating the Trogs with various wires and gears as Thermoplug gloated over an intercom. Realizing he wouldn't have a better chance to kill his former friend, Thermoplug himself arrives on the scene to kill the High Tinker. But Mechatork's clever repurposing of a trap mechanism released a tensely wound spring that cuts Thermoplug in half, severing his legs. Examining the body of his former friend and the cause of all of his agony, the High Tinker realized that Thermoplug's battle suit had cauterized his wound with little blood loss, and that he probably would survive. Galbin left Sicko for dead in his old office, 
hoping his suffering would be prolonged, as he believed it was a fitting punishment for all he had done. The High Tinker decided that if the rats or the trogs didn't kill him, then he couldn't think of a better leader for the malformation trogs than Thermoplug himself. After the Cataclysm occurred, larger portions of Gnomergon began to be reconquered for the gnomes, and eventually a cure for the irradiation was developed for those leper gnomes who were stuck in the city during its fall years ago. The cure was developed by a gnomish organization called SAFE, which stands for Survivor Assistance Facilitation Expedition. Soon, all that had remained under Thermoplug's rule, who had survived, was the deepest depths of the city itself. Eventually, the G-Team, a gnomish strike team, allied with some of the Alliance heroes and infiltrated Thermoplug's lair, and put an end to the malformed, irradiated, quote, King of Gnomergon himself. With Sicko finally dead, the gnomes worked with Safe to continue clearing the rest of their former city of radiation. When Gilneas requested to join the Alliance after the Cataclysm, the High Tinker represented the gnomes and voted to allow the Worgen into the Alliance. Finally, the last appearance of Mechatork is in the novel Tides of War, where he travels to Stormwind after Garrosh uses a mana bomb to destroy Theramore. Here, him and the other Alliance leaders plan a counterattack to break the Horde's blockade of Theramore and Kalimdor. Mechatork noticed that nobody had mentioned the fate of any survivors of the city, and questioned if anybody had traveled there to search for some. Anduin Rin tells him that Jaina Prodmore had survived and went to the city to look for survivors. While overjoyed at her survival, he was then confused as to why she had not attended the meeting to strategize alongside them. It was not until Varian told him that she was pursuing her own methods that he dropped the subject. When the Alliance leaders meet during the Landfall campaign to discuss the pros and cons of using the Shah power, the High Tinker himself does not attend, as he is busy cleaning up the rest of his city. He instead sends Tinkmaster Overspark, the chief engineer of Nomergon, in his place. Now, I'm going to move on to some of Mechatork's inventions. As the gnomes choose their leader based on their ingenuity and technical prowess, it should be of no surprise that Gelbin Mechatork has a laundry list of inventions under his belt. Although I mentioned a few in his history, the High Tinker's most important inventions include the Mechano Strider, the Gyromatic Micro Adjuster, which is something engineers might recognize, the Repair Bot, the Dwarven Siege Engine, and of course, the Deep Run Tram itself. I'm now going to mention some personality traits of the High Tinker that I might have missed during the history portion. For all of Gelbin's advantages, he blames himself for Nomergon's fall for many years. Before retaking portions of the city, he grew increasingly depressed at his trusting of Thermoplug. Those lives that were lost weigh heavily on his mind, and even when his forces do begin reclaiming areas inside the city, Gelbin's hope for the future of the gnomes continues to diminish. A turning point occurs, however, when he confronts and subsequently cuts Thermoplug in half in his former office. During the fight, the High Tinker regains his hope for the future, and realizes that despite his former friend's betrayal, it had only been because of his new friends in the Alliance who are all working together to reclaim Nobergon for the sake of the gnomes alone. He finally banishes his inner demons and begins to believe that not only will Nomergon rise again, but will be even better than it once was. And while I touched on this earlier, several examinations of Mechatork's character in the extended universe reveal that his biggest fault is his inability to properly deal with his emotions due to his perceived duties as the leader. He believes that he must be the High Tinker first and foremost, and Gelbin second. He understands science in the universe much more than his own emotions. However, he gradually begins to grow as a person, primarily due to the sacrifices of the Alliance races in their efforts during Operation Nomergon. Now, I'm going to include some tidbits of information about Mechatork that I could not find appropriate to include in other places. As of Mists of Pandaria, Galbin Mechatork is only one of four surviving Alliance rulers from the Second War when he ascended to the position of High Tinker. The other three are Varian Rin, Kurdran Wildhammer, and Gen Greymane, who admittedly has had a pretty big character switch. Next, the position of the High Tinker is an elected one, but there is seemingly not a term limit on how long the position can be held. With the closest time frame being the Second War for his election, Galbin has been the leader of the Gnomes for at least 25 years. Third, while the High Tinker position is the official title of the elected office, the High Tinker is also allowed to choose a title for himself. 
In a bit of an act of egotism, Galvin had taken the title King of the Gnomes himself as a secondary title. In a bit of odd irony, Thermoplug chose the same title for himself after the city fell. The difference is, however, that Galvin freely admits that his position as, quote, king holds no actual legal authority, and he just likes how it sounds. Next, a fairly consistent comparison can be made between Galvin Mechatork and Vol'jin. Both were betrayed by a very close friend, Thermoplug for Mechatork and Zalazane for Vol'jin. Both of them are forced out of their homes, Nomergon for Mechatork and the Echo Isles for Vol'jin. Both lead a force to retake their home, Operation Nomergon for Mechatork and Zalazane's Fall, respectively. Both used to reside in another race's capital city, Ironforge and Orgrimmar, respectively. And finally, both were chosen to be the faction leader that taps the keg during the Brewfest holiday. And finally, Mechatork wields a specially stylized weapon called the Wrench Caliber. In the novel Wolfheart, it was described as being a complex series of cogs, pistons, runes, and levers that could double as a mace as well as serve the role of several tools. The runes seemingly enable lightning to be channeled through the weapon, as can be evidenced in several pieces of art and during some battle animations during the Operation Nomergon world event in which Mechatork takes part. Okay, so that's the end of his history and character traits and inventions, so now we're going to move on to the opinion portion. So for the opinion portion of this video, I thought about what I'd like to see about the future of the gnomes in the Warcraft lore, because actually there is no immediate lore for them coming up. Like I did for the 5.3 story a few weeks ago, this part of this video is going to be a little more off the cuff and not selectively laid out as the rest of the video was. I might begin to sound like a broken record regarding the Alliance lore in 5.3 and the future of Warcraft, but with nothing really new to talk about, I've been reflecting more on what I disliked in Mists of Pandaria rather than the many, many things that I did like about the expansion. To begin, I can appreciate the fact that the Alliance actually isn't just lying down and taking the Horde's beating in this expansion. But from a lore standpoint, I really wish we could see more than just Varian, Anduin, and Jaina for lore on the Alliance side. There are some of our non-human heroes like Tyrande and Moira that do appear, but they do so in more of a cameo than any real significant storyline contribution. Hell, Velen is supposedly the one who heals up Anduin between 5.1 and 5.2, but we don't even get a token appearance. Once again, the poor Draenei are left with no lore of their own. But going back to the gnomes, it does seem a bit odd that the most technologically advanced race that the Alliance has is basically only used for their technology, but don't appear in any actual capacity. In World of Warcraft, every time the gnomes involve themselves, they usually have a general better track of victory in terms of the Alliance and the other races, so I don't see why they shouldn't get their time to shine as well. Oh, and by the way, hello, they also have death rays and nuclear bombs. Why is the Alliance content with wasting the lives of their soldiers when they can use the robotic forces and technology of the gnomes to turn the tide in battle? But now we come to the part that I really dislike about the lore and the gnomes. They always seem to be placed into this comedic role. In the one example where the gnomes are fighting by themselves versus a horde faction, they get paired up with the goblins. And the battleground between these two and Stone Talon, while arguably important, is actually very comedic when you look at it as a whole. Basically, the entire quest line is about the zany ways in which the two most technologically advanced races in the whole world are fighting one another. So my ultimate question is this. Why are the gnomes always regulated to the comedic role? Is it because they're short and sometimes have pitched voices? Is that it, really? Those two things are ridiculously flimsy and ultimately childish if those are the only reasons, and that seems to be all I can figure out. And just so that I'm not accused of being more biased than I actually already am, this entire rant can be applied to the goblins, too. Just replaced high-pitched voice with greedy, and it fits the exact same way. What personally annoys me is that Blizzard both plays to this stupid trope while also making characters that completely break it. They have no problem making the one battlefield in Stone Talon Mountains involving the gnomes completely ridiculous, while simultaneously having their faction leader have absolutely no elements of this ridiculousness of the race that he actually leads. Think about Mechatork's history that I just explained. He's a genius inventor who's, who is elected the leader of his race, causing his best friend to become jaded, lie to his face, and end up killing off 80% of the race that he leads. Where's any of that stupid tropism that the rest of the gnomes experience in his character? 
It's just not there. And there's a word for this dynamic between these two types of things. It's inconsistency. And that is something that I honestly cannot stand in any story that I'm reading. I ranted about it in my video about Garrosh, and it is also my biggest issue with the gnomes and the alliance in the whole of the lore of Warcraft. Now, there's actually a really easy place to put the gnomes in both the Siege of Orgrimmar and the next expansion, which for argument's sake I'm just going to assume is the Legion-based one. Now, for the Siege of Orgrimmar, we already know that the Bilgewater goblins have left the Horde and joined the Rebellion, so it's a perfect opportunity for both of those races to have a part in taking down Garrosh. Mainly I say this because when the gnomes have a part in the Alliance's story, the Horde's version is exactly the same, but just mirrored with the goblins. With Garrosh having so utterly fortified Orgrimmar, both the Rebellion and the Alliance need an unconventional way to get actually into the city. And just take a guess which two races have pretty awesomely powerful technology for a world that has just swords and magic. That's right, it's the gnomes and the goblins. From things like death rays, to invisibility fields, to teleporters, to shredders, to arcane nullifiers, to spider tanks, to clockwork goblins, and even zeppelins. There's so much potential there, and even a decent amount of those technologies don't need to be spun from a lore perspective to make sense in the story. We don't need the gnomes and the goblins to be completely absent and then just show up when their technology is needed to fill a space. That's not good storytelling, and people who actually enjoy those races, and not for the stupid tropes that they've been written to express like me, we actually want to see story where they're involved in a serious capacity. I mean, it's so bad that the Goblin's faction leader doesn't even appear in the game, and the Gnomes one just sits in their town and hasn't done anything significant for basically an expansion and a half now. As for the next expansion, I assume we're going to be going back into outer space to fight the Burning Legion, most presumably to Argus or perhaps Zoroth. And again, remember all those things I just listed? They work just as well on another planet, especially since the only spacefaring race in either the Horde or the Alliance is the Draenei, and they didn't even make their ship. All they did was run away and then crash it onto another planet. So to wrap up, I want to make a statement directly to Blizzard. <clears throat> Blizzard, please give the gnomes more screen time. When they aren't regulated to a stupid comedic effect of her her, them gnomes, they be short and they have high-pitched voices, they actually have some really cool moments, such as during Operation Gnomergon. They are one of the most two technologically advanced races on the entire planet, and it would be nice to see them have some screen time, not, and not just their technology. And since the gnomes are getting screen time, give some to Mechatork too. His history is awesome, and he's such a badass character. And with that, that's it, my Mechatork video. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you believe I have something wrong, or I omitted something, please feel free to leave those in the comments below. Also, tell me what you would like to see for the future of the gnomes in the Warcraft lore. I'd love to hear your ideas, because I think there is definitely a niche for them to fill. And finally, if you like this character examination, please tell me which characters you'd like to see next. Thus far I've done Garrosh, Rathion, and now Mechatork, so that's the Horde, Neutral, and then Alliance. I'm not going to say I'm going to switch to a Horde again, but I possibly might. But if you change my mind, it is possible. I was thinking on doing Varian, and then somebody suggested Mechatork. So that's what you ended up with. So let me hear your comments and your suggestions in the comments below. If you like this video and you want to help me out, you can like, favorite, comment, and subscribe to do so. But if you want to go above and beyond to help me, the best way you could do that would be to share my video and channel with people that you think would like the lore and my spin on things. So thanks again everybody. My name as always is Necroxus. And I will see you next time for a look at another one of Warcraft's characters. And another look at Warcraft's lore. Because, like I say, there is always more lore to explore. Farewell.